because through the years and the trials we've covered on, on Core TV, Ashley, um, we've seen it done many times. And, and sometimes it's absolutely amazing how a piece of evidence that you wouldn't think would lead to anything can lead to a killer. Yeah, it can be so itty bitty, teeny weeny that nobody would even think that it's dropped into the crime scene and it is a popcorn trail to the killer. But that is exactly what we're looking at tonight, Vinny, with what was found when they unearthed the remains of JJ and Tylee. And I think it's best right now probably to read directly from the affidavit and describe for you exactly how those kids were found and what was found. And if you have a, a soft spot and you struggle with this stuff, I'm going to give you a little bit of a moment to turn away and maybe turn your volume down. Um, it'll be over in a minute, but it's important because these are facts that matter. Page nine of that affidavit that dropped last week says this. It describes JJ's shallow grave. On the north side of the pond, near the north edge of the property, a patch of ground appeared to be disturbed. Weed growth was shorter than the surrounding weed growth. Sod etching was also noticed. Underneath the layer of sod were several large flat rocks and two pieces of flat paneling. Investigators exposed a round object covered in black plastic. An FBI ERT member used a sharp instrument and made a small incision in the plastic. And a layer of white plastic was then observed. An incision was made in the white layer of plastic, exposing what would appear to be human remains, the crown of the head covered in light brown hair. The remaining dirt around the object was methodically removed, exposing what appeared to be a body wrapped in black plastic. The black plastic appeared to be tightly wrapped around the body and secured <clears throat> with gray duct tape. That's gonna matter in just a moment. Um, that's the, de the description of how the investigators found JJ over by that pond. It's like a dry pit, <clears throat> but, but basically it's the, the pond. But I also want to tell you about Tylee's remains. That's what's closer to that fire pit, uh, right near that red barn there. <clears throat> Again, from the affidavit, a second site of interest was located behind a red unattached outbuilding located roughly in the center of the property near a fire pit, an area used as a pet cemetery. Several areas of disturbed ground were located. A buried cat and dog remains were found. And several other items of interest were found, including other bones, charred tissue, and charred bones, human remains, non-adult human remains. Vinny, as all of this was happening, I need to tell you what was, um, what was going on uh, that isn't underground, it's right on top of the ground. Chad Daybell was sitting in his driveway. You can, I'm not sure if you can even make it out, but he was sitting in his car in his driveway watching the investigators as they started their dig. Then he moved his car across the street to his daughter's house and sat in the driveway from there, maybe to get a better view. But they said he intently stared at them while he did this. And the minute they discovered the head of JJ, that would be the beginning of their excavations of human remains, Chad took off. He took off. And they chased him. And they did a traffic stop and they arrested him. And that was the last time Chad was walking around these parts. So that's kind of how that day progressed. But JJ's remains really could tell quite a story. Uh, Vinny, I don't think it was lost on you that there were flat rocks and panels used under the ground. And maybe to the untrained eye, you'd wonder why. But maybe to a grave digger, you might know that as a body decomposes, it will probably become smaller. And then the earth above it will collapse in and there might be a divot and that might be noticeable later on. I don't know. I'm just waxing here. But prior cases that we've covered, Vinny, have been solved because of things that were described in that affidavit, like garbage bags and duct tape. Do you remember Melanie McGuire back in 2007? Yeah, she's from, she's from New Jersey, like me. I absolutely remember that case. Uh, Melanie McGuire um, murders her husband, dismembers the body, wraps it up, and then puts it in some suitcases and uh, dumps it in the Chesapeake Bay. Yeah, used garbage bags and uh, duct tape. And who knew that garbage bags actually have their own little signature. They have something called striations. They have patterns. And one garbage bag found around a body 
can easily be matched with other garbage bags found under your sink because they come from the same lot and the same tools are used to spin them off the production line. Who knew? We found out in Melanie McGuire. Have a look at that moment. When you refer to striation lines, th those, uh, those refer to what on the garbage bags themselves? They're clear or dark lines through the, through the, the bag. Um, we have a wood grain pattern. They're like, they look like, I guess, arrowheads. You could look at, you can say they're chevrons. It's, it's, it's a dark pattern throughout the bag. There's a fine, clear line that goes down the, down the, the bag all the way through. All right, and that's throughout the bag. If you look up really close, you can see them. All right, and they're the striation, um, extrusion striations that we, we examine. And they're spaced apart uh, throughout the, the uh, length of this bag, okay? And they're thicker, some are thicker, some are, are thinner. It depends, it, depending on the bag that you're looking at. And there are key factors when we do a bag examination to look for that, that die striations. They have to match up, okay? They, they're there. Um, it's real simple. I, I've been doing this now, and, and what I to do is you can take a bag and you're garbage bag and look it up in the sun and you can actually see certain bags have just the extrusion lines and maybe the pigment. Um, some will have this chevron or this wood grain pattern depending on the type of plastic they use depends on what kind of pattern they have and it's a constant flow. Right? They add the, the molten plastic, it goes through this extruder so um, it's kind of like the fingerprint of that extrusion line, or the the, uh, the line that makes the bags. Mm. I wonder if the person who wrapped JJ up in a garbage bag knew any of that. I'm sure that person is probably none too thrilled to learn of it. But by the way, Melanie's case also told us something about duct tape, Vinny. Uh, duct tape is forensic gold. Um, because it's sticky and that adhesive grabs everything. It grabs dust particles, fabric particles, DNA, fingerprints. It grabs everything. And so it usually goes off for analysis. And when Melanie McGuire's duct tape went off for analysis, oh, gee whiz, a little portion of her red nail polish was stuck on the duct tape. Here's how that played out. The I'm last sorry. one is the duct tape um, recovered from a small plastic bag inside that suitcase, and that would have been item 21. Um, that's when I recovered a, the uh, nail polish um, on the uh, duct tape. Hmm. So again, I wonder whoever wrapped JJ up was realizing that your fingerprints get on duct tape because it's sticky. And so does your DNA, and so do the fabric of your clothes, little fibers, things you can't see with the naked eye maybe. Do you remember, Vinny, another case um, in which duct tape featured prominently? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, and, and I remember the moment. Uh, the, jury actually, the, the jury saw it, but viewers at home didn't necessarily see it. And we're talking about uh, when the mother of Kaylee Marie Anthony was tried for her murder, uh, there was uh -huh. duct tape that was placed over the mouth of Kaylee Marie. And I remember the moment uh, and again, we didn't show it to viewers where they lift the skull up and you can see the way the duct tape went right over the nose and mouth mm. of Kaylee Marie, uh, of the remains that were left. And there were hairs from Kaylee Marie that were stuck in that duct tape. Yet, yeah. 12 people from Pinellas County, Florida. I said, knew, I know. Have a nice I, I day. I know you're going to say it. I know you're going to say it. I know it. But I had to bring it up because I don't think there's going to be one show that I do where I don't mention all roads lead back to Casey. Um, the reason I bring it up, though, um, is, is specific. Casey's case had that duct tape found. The, the, the remains of her daughter had duct tape. And they did analyze it. They did look for it. And what they discovered was not so much the uh, fingerprints or DNA or anything like that. What they discovered was that that duct tape matched a roll at the Anthony house. Apparently it was very rare duct tape. It was called Henkel duct tape. I think we might even have a picture of it because George Anthony was using that duct tape to put up posters of missing Haley. And that featured in the trial. The jurors got to see the duct tape used on the missing posters. And see if we can roll that. There's a very, very short moment in, in Casey Anthony's trial, but it was the linchpin that brought 
the duct tape on the body of Kaylee Anthony. It brought it right into the Anthony home. So whoever wrapped up little Kaylee was using the roll of duct tape from the Anthony home. Um, and you know what? It was kind of fascinating because they also found a little sticker stuck to the duct tape. And that sticker had a heart shape. And that sticker was something that was similar to what could be found in little Kaylee's bedroom. Have a look at how that played out. It was approximately the size of a dime. And the best way to illustrate what I saw was if you were to wear a Band-Aid for an extended period of time and eventually remove that Band-Aid, you have that glue or debris sur um, surrounding the outer edges of that Band-Aid. The outline of the heart resembled that glue or debris that if you had been wearing a Band-Aid for an extended period of time, however, in the shape, rather than in the shape of a Band-Aid, it was in the shape of a heart. Oh, that was one of the more heartbreaking, um, sorry, sorry for that pun, it wasn't intended, um, heartbreaking moments of that trial, knowing that uh, Kaylee's body had been disposed of with a heart-shaped sticker um, over the duct tape. But I should also mention, Vinny, just for those who are watching who are true crime fans, the duct tape might have been the worst part of the case for the prosecutors because they wanted, and this is where I argue with you, I, I side with the jury here. They wanted the jury to believe that Casey put that duct tape over the nose and mouth of her own living, breathing daughter and watched her die. But they had no evidence to suggest that. It was just the size of the piece. And they kind of tried to theorize and match it up, you know, with the skull. And it was, a, I think, a big reach. I really felt it was a big reach. You don't think so? No, it was there. The duct tape was there. I mean, how, someone dies accidentally and then you, you duct tape their mouth? Yeah. What? Yeah. Who, who, yeah, you who try to make that? it look like there's a... Who does that? You, you try to make it look like there's a boogeyman in the neighborhood. I, I really, to this day, think that Casey did something terribly uh, negligent and reckless and, and that child died and then she panicked and tried everything. She's such a good liar that she lied by her actions, in my opinion. So, I felt that she lied by her actions and how she may have disposed of that, uh, that, that body. Yeah, she lied every time she opened her mouth, but I mean, the prosecutor argued, and, 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 and I thought it was a common sense argument, who takes an accident and then tries to make it look like first degree murder? No one. And by the way, if she, if she <laughs> no one is like pool, Casey. Oh, no one's like Casey. Who lies and, and about by the way, anything and I, everything? But if she drowned in the pool, there was a test you could have done on the bones. There was a yeah, test on that, her I, remains. I don't think that and there were only bones left. That you, it, no, it didn't happen. But if this was an accident, like was argued, the defense should have tested the bones. But instead, mm -hmm. no, they didn't. No. Did they? I know, and you know, we should do a whole hour on Casey, honestly, because I could argue till that cows come home on that one. But in the end, there were no fingerprints, I, sh I should mention, on, on Casey's um, uh, duct tape or Kaylee's duct tape. So that was a little more tricky. And, and as we all know, and as Vinny always remembers to tell me, um, it was a not guilty verdict for Casey, despite all the duct tape, despite all that evidence, despite everything, despite all her lies. Melanie McGuire, however, that was not so lucky for her. That duct tape and those garbage bags and that evidence, the same kind of evidence we're seeing in J.J. Vallow's excavation of his gravesite. For Melanie McGuire, that was, well, let me just show you how it played out. How do you find us to the count of the indictment charging Melanie McGuire with the murder of William McGuire between on or about April 28, 2004 and on or about May 5, 2004, in the township of Woodbridge, Middlesex County, New Jersey, elsewhere and within the jurisdiction of this court. Guilty. Oh, darn. Uh, I was waiting for this moment where she just fell apart. Um, I remember watching that trial live, Vinny, and uh, Melanie was a mess. She was a wreck. She was clawing at Joey Tacopina, our friend who was his defense, her defense attorney. She could barely stand up after that guilty verdict. I don't think she thought that was coming, despite all that evidence. Yeah, and, and one of the most compelling pieces of evidence was the lack of evidence, because the prosecution theory was that he was killed in the in the shower in the in the bathroom, mm. but the mm. bathroom was so clean. Someone had gone in that bathroom and cleaned everything out. Like if you, if you just go to anyone's bathroom, you're going to find stuff everywhere, right? You're going to be able to pick up DNA everywhere. But they couldn't mm. find anything in that bathroom because someone had cleaned it so meticulously. And the prosecution well, argued that the lack of evidence was was proof uh, that someone had yeah. committed the murder and cleaned it up.
So I'm glad you brought that up because on that duct tape in Melanie's case, not only was that little piece of red nail polish um, found, but also stubble. Um, stubble that was hers and stubble that was his. Now, where do you find stubble cut on both ends? You find that usually in a bathroom. It's usually the kind of thing that might be getting on duct tape if you're duct taping up a body in the bathroom. But I should also mention that there was some tissue of Bill, her husband, um, that may have been transferred by either Melanie or whoever helped Melanie on the bottom of their feet into the floor mats of the car. But I think what this really tells us, Vinny, as we look at the, the, the Vallow case and the Daybell case and where those cases are going and what those investigators have and what they're testing right now, is that it's the CSI thing again. All of these criminals think because they watch TV and they watch forensic files, uh, they know how to commit the perfect crime. And I got news for y'all. There is no such thing as the perfect crime because microscopic stuff just gets around. Ashley, thank you so much.